Thank you. Thank you. All right. Respect. All right. So uh, today is going to happen. So we're going to finally leave the multi-body system dynamics. And we're going to discuss uh, modeling of hydraulics. And, you know, I need to let you know that, uh, you know, once I got this COVID, I've been not feeling that strong. And long days like today is going to be is a little bit too much for me. So today, too, we're going to close earlier than usually. I'm sorry about that. You know, my favorite period of the week is this lecture. But still, because it's afternoon lecture, it's uh, a little bit too much for me. So that's why we are not going to be here hour and a half, but something a little less than that. But we still cannot skip the lecture. And the reason being that uh, we are in a somewhat tight schedule. You know, we're supposed to uh, cover the hydraulics within the next... Um, two weeks, I would say, three weeks max. And that's simply because your simulation assignment is about hydraulic modeling. So you need to be aware of the things that builds you a hydraulic model. So that's why we're going to open the topic today. And if everything goes as planned, we are able to cover the important subject matters, such like properties of fluids. And then there's something that is the most important thing about the modeling of hydraulics, which is called lump fluid theory. This is something that lays the foundation about the hydraulic modeling. This is the way how you can kind of create the equation of motion for hydraulics. You already learned how to create the equation of motion for mechanical system. And lump fluid theory gives you a tool set to do the same for hydraulic system. Now, that's what we're aiming today. If you understand that, that's, that's a big deal. And you kind of need to understand it too, because uh, if you don't, you will make awful lot of mistakes about here and there, and then the system will behave in chaotic matter. And not because it behaves chaotic matter in the reality, but simply because you have some misunderstanding in your model. So that's what we're hoping to cover. Now, let me see how are the online participants doing. I guess, okay, but there is some disappointing news in online participants. We have only 35 people following online. That's uh, lower than usually. All right? You choose your way, but remember, this is the only way to pass this course is the following the lectures. Not necessarily the only way. You can also study the lecture note, but that's a hard way. That's a little bit of a rocky way. Okay. Anyways, so... Uh, with that, let me now just jump into modeling of hydraulics. Short motivation, very short one. Where is that the hydraulics is being used? Well, roughly speaking, mobile machinery is a very good application for hydraulics. And like I mentioned a week ago, this is simply because the power density is superior in hydraulics comparing any other means of actuators. And that means that, you know, small physical dimensions like hydraulic cylinder here is capable to produce quite a bit of forces. And that's what makes it very pleasant to be used in mobile machinery. It can be used in industrial applications too. You know, roughly speaking, we have industrial applications which is like paper making machines, uh, pulp and paper machines in general, and then this mobile machinery. Rotating machines mostly are related to these industrial applications. There, every now and then you need to introduce a motion with a lot of forces on it. And the best way to make it happen is using hydraulics. So here are the couple really, up, you know, not so updated videos. These are telling the videos and animations from the models that were made already, not 100 years ago, but uh, let's say roughly 20 years ago. This is when we started to look at this, something that is called coupled simulation. Coupled simulation that we're combining mechanics and actuators to one simulation package. And that's example is here. So this is a harvester crane. I don't know if this is, is this playing? Uh, no, it's not willing to play. Let me try one more time. Yeah, it is playing, you know. Hydraulics is moving the crane back and forth and it's cutting these trees. So it's very simple procedure that it is doing. This is a pilot drive, very old model. 
but the pilot drive, the boom itself, let me see if I can play this. No, I'm not willing to play. Let me go back. Yeah, you know, this boom structure here, this one here where the pilot drive is located at, it can be move, uh, you know, left and right, uh, front and back using the hydraulic cylinders. And here is an industrial application. This is related to one of the special rolls that I use in a paper making process. This is a roll that is called deflection compensated rolls. And those of you that are participating in Professor Andrew's course, I heard, I don't know if this is true, but I heard that this kind of a roll is one of his favorite components in hydraulics. And he keep on telling us stories about this kind of deflection compensated rolls. Is that correct? You haven't heard about that. You haven't heard about it, that. Okay, so uh, to explain this, you know, I need to show you a picture. You know, paper making process is mainly about pressing the raw material together. And this can be accomplished by using cylindrical shape of bodies. Rolls, these are the called rolls. Sorry about my low quality drawings, but uh, they're like two different kind of rolls like this. All right, and then you're pressing them together by using uh, a significant amount of forces, typically hydraulics. And this works okay, but because the current machines that you can find in a real, real life, I mean, paper making machines, they are having the dimension where this width here is 10 meters, sometimes even more than that. There is a certain amount of mechanical deformation due to the gravity, because there is no possible are not possible to make a roll which is uh, mechanically rigid. That's not going to happen. So they will deform because of the gravity. And because of the gravity, when they, they deform, it's going to be a situation like this. Okay, this is extreme case. But still, you get an idea. And then you compress together, and they will be compressed here, whereas in the middle, there's an air gap. And to get rid of this, there's a type of the roll, which is called deflection compensated roll. Let me go back. I think there's enough space to make my drawings. So that's a system that consists of shaft that is standing still, so it's connected to frame, if you may. And then there is a shell that is rotating around the stationary shaft. And how it makes this rotation is based on this kind of a hydraulic loading shoes. And these loading shoes have a two different features. You know, first of all, they work as a journal bearing, as a lubricant, to make sure that this cell can rotate around the, the shaft. That's one purpose. Because, but the way they are designed, it's also possible to introduce some internal forces between the shaft and the cell. And it's possible to make the cell to deform with respect to shaft like this. Not this much, but you get the concept. And this is the one that is called deflection compensated roll. So hydraulics used here in uh, loading shoes will introduce mechanical deformation within this roll structure. That's how it is. You want to hear a story of my life? No, but I still am going to tell it that to you. You know, this all happened a little while ago. I got my uh, doctor, de doctor degree from um, 97, 1997, yes, 1997. And uh, once I got my doctor degree, I worked a little while in a company that was making these paper making machines called Walmart. And I was specialized to this kind of a deflection compensated roles. So, these kind of roles were all my life, work life at the time. So I know the, quite much about the details of this kind of the roles. All right, so this is how they behave. So now the cell is rotating. There is this loading shoes, both ends. They work like a tonal bearing, but because they, work, they can be loaded as well, they can introduce this mechanical deformation. And the roll, no, the shaft becomes to be oval in a shape. That that's what it is doing, compensating the deformation due to the gravity. 
Okay, makes sense. Here's a one more video. Oh, this is. Let me see. Yeah. Okay. This is a different kind of a crane structures that are, again are operated by hydraulics. So this is a. This you can see how is that you can uh, monitor the hydraulic circuit. So this is a model, not the real system, but the model. And you can see how are the spools, how they're moving when you're operating the crane. You can also the measure the pressures in different locations of hydraulic circuit. This, by the way, is the view, the one you saw just a little while ago, is the view that you need to get used to. Because we are not going to show the physical components but the drawing symbols of hydraulic components. So if you're not familiar with the drawing symbols, please familiarize yourself with them. Okay, so this is how they operate. I don't know how lengthy is this animation. It becomes to be end. So not far from the end anymore. Okay, you don't see that much, but this is how they look like, and this is a kind of like a same kind of animation than in a mechanical components. In hydraulics, you don't see that much. You only see the moving components that are spools, and that's it. Then you can print the pressures with respect to time, and that's about it. All right. So this is what I already mentioned to you. So the physically components used in a hydraulics they look like the ones that you can see here in the left hand side hydraulic cylinder look like this but how we can illustrate it will be looking like this so is a hydraulic cylinder where there is a possibility to pressurize the piston side and piston rod side so two-way cylinder you can run this cylinder to left and right right and left I say it in correct order, but it moves back and forth. And then other components that I use here is like direction valve here. This is how it physically look like. But drawing symbol is this. It means that this is manually operated because there's a shaft that moves spool back and forth. There is a springs that put it in a central position. If not motion or not force introduced by shaft and that's about it. Then this one here is a pressure relief valve. It looks like this. Drawing symbol is this one here. Now, if there's excessive, I mean, that if there is a valve in a middle position, you are pressurizing the system by using a pump. And you need to get rid of the extra energy. And the way you can get rid of it is that you can operate and you can monitor the pressure right before the pressure relief valve. And as soon as the pressure goes higher than presetted val pre value, the valve will be opening like this. And the flow goes back to the tank. And then you circulate your flow like shown in this, uh, this drawing here. And then these uh, symbol throttle valves that are shown here, they look physically like this. But this is something you're all familiar with. So no big surprises there. Again, this is what I mentioned already. And this time we're gonna focus on this. Something that I mentioned earlier, co-simulation or coupled simulation is something that we take these two disciplines into account simultaneously. That's what it means. There are many ways to do it. And we're gonna discuss about these many ways, possibly in my last lecture, that will be in, uh, let me do the math. So how many, this is a uh, number nine. So in uh, four weeks, we're getting close, we're getting into the course. And then, uh, yeah, there's gonna be a, a little bit stories about what is that we can do with the simulation in my final, final lecture. A little bit about the real time simulation, a little bit about the recent developments in terms of research. If no other lectures to participate, I recommend you to participate that. It's gonna be 
kind of like going to movie theater, but more fun. I can guarantee you that. You can take some popcorns and soda with you if you want, and you just lay back and enjoy. Or you can follow that using this online option as well. Okay, online participant says respect. All right, with that, properties are fluid. So, we're going to take a look at the two different properties of fluid, two only. There are more than the two, but uh, we're going to take a look at two because the two are important in terms of modeling. Actually, one only is important in terms of modeling. The one where we're going to, the one that is mentioned here, is, which is viscosity, is less significant because the viscosity is a property of a fluid that affects only when you deal with the laminar type of the flow. What are these flow types? You don't need to know them yet. I'm going to introduce them to you, if not today, then a week from now. And laminar flow takes a place when the pressure difference, relatively speaking, is low. And in a mobile machinery, that's seldom the case. It can happen, but it's not common case that the pressure difference over the throttle is small. Usually, we're speaking about the pressure difference, which is, uh, let's say, more than uh, 50 bars, sometimes more than 100 bars. And in cases like that, the flow type is turbulent flow. And that's uh, viscosity is not playing theoretically any role whatsoever. So we get back to this. But second topic, bulk modelers, is extremely important. This is what defines flexibility of fluid, flexibility of hydraulics. All right. So, you know, flexibility is something that um, you often need to, to take into account to make sure that your model is realistic enough. Sometimes the flexibility, when you look at these uh, kind of the hydraulically driven cranes like this one here, Sometimes the flexibility may be because of the mechanical structures, maybe because of the arms are slender, and they will introduce a certain amount of deformation. But it's also very common that the hydraulic actuators will introduce certain amount of flexibility because they are not rigid. You know, there is a, this misinterpretation or misunderstanding that the hydraulic actuators are rigid, and they are not they will introduce a certain level of flexibility for the system. And the flexibility that they will introduce can be accounted by using bulk models. It's having close relation to elastic models using uh, structural strength. So it's uh, kind of the same story. The bulk models, excuse me, the elastic models tells you what kind of material you're dealing with and how flexible is a material. Bulk modulus, same thing, but for fluids and hydraulics more generally. Okay, so uh, those are the two things. We will take a look. We will also take a look at this land fluid theory, and then we're gonna have this strong interaction communication like so far. All right, here we have a deal. Any comments, by the way? All clear, too clear, too clear. All right. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, well, this is a little bit of what I just mentioned. You know, uh, bulk models is really important because it introduced the flexibility in terms of control, in terms of for the uh, operation. Flexibility is, generally speaking, your enemy. You want to get rid of that as much as you can. And there are certain ways you can do to minimize it and uh, control the flexibility. And uh, like in uh, hydraulics, the, one of the really drawbacks that lowers the flexibility is dissolved air and the use of hoses. Why is that the big problem? I will, tell, I will get back to that momentarily. All right? But properties of fluids. Ah, okay. All right, so this is, uh, so I got, uh, all right, I have uh, some serious problem here because uh, obviously my slides are not the one that I would like to show you today. So there's missing awful lot of material here. 
So I'm not going to jump these in-class quiz right away, but instead I need to take a look at my, my PowerPoint. I don't know what happened. Obviously, I downloaded incorrect uh, PowerPoint from my folder. Just a second. All right. So can you guys see what I do now? No, you don't. Okay. Just a second, I need to download it again. And I, I think that I need to combine it to this presentation sometimes later. So I was thinking that why it took so long time to upload all the material. And I guess that was simply because it was incorrect presentation all the time. Okay. So momentarily we get back to this. Okay, just need to find the proper year. This is it. Sorry about the confusion. Okay, so... Uh, Okay, so I think that other than the other than the mistakes that I had in the beginning, it's okay. So uh, mm, just a second. No, it is missing a pretty serious part of my my presentation. Just uh, maybe here. Oh, yeah, now it looks okay. But, uh, mm, okay, because the, the presentation mode is different than usually. I might need to use a material that I introduced you a week ago. Okay, so it's going to be uh, this one. No, I don't want to update the links. And I need to scroll down all the way to hydraulics. Okay, now it's looking good. All right, so I need to give you a warning, a little bit of warning, because I, it appears that I need to jump back and forth with the two different presentations. The one that is uh, the one that I wanted to show, and the one that is uh, the one that is missing a little bit of material. So this is it. So uh, you don't see it yet. We were in this slide, I think. Okay, so first thing we're gonna take a look is the bulk models. All right, and like I said, this is the really the important one. If there's something you wanna skip, that's a viscosity. Because viscosity in a mobile machinery, which we are mainly interested in, is uh, less significant. Okay. What is the deal with the bulk models then? So let's take a look at that. So let's get started from that. Okay, the first statement that is saying here in upper part of the slide is say that the oil is compressible. And uh, it is compressible. Like sometimes it is a misunderstanding that the fluid is not compressible. And uh, to prove that that's not the case is uh, if you go to local swimming pool with me, you know, when I'm speaking to you right now, what happens in physics is that, you know, there are waves leaving from my mouth, going to your head, and they build the picture of what's going on. And you hear me, you don't necessarily understand me, but you hear me, correct? You hear me all the time. And this is because the, oil, the, the air here is flexible. That's why the waves can travel here to your head. You agree? Okay, now if we're gonna all go to a local swimming pool, we go under the water, and I'm not gonna teach you, you will still hear me, but you're not gonna hear me well. You're gonna hear me like, ooh, 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 like pretty much is the case today, too. 
but not as loud, as clear, as eerie and electrical. Why is that you hear me? Because it's the water, the fluid is flexible. You know, when I'm speaking to you, the waves are traveling in the water differently than in the air. You know, roughly speaking, when I'm comparing the air stiffness, flexibility would be the better way to use it. And uh, fluid flexibility, which is oil, you know, the air is, you know, or the maybe better way to say that the oil is a uh, 1,000 times, 2,000 times more rigid than, oil, than air here. So there's a significant difference. That's why if you have a little bit of dissolved air in your system, they're going to destroy the rigid or the, or the kind of the lower the flexibility of your hydraulic system. Okay. But if we agree that fluid is flexible, let's make an experiment here. And in this experiment, I'm going to take a lid, which is rigid. Well, you don't have it in real life, but let's just assume this to be rigid. This one here is rigid. So there's a rigid container here, unit in a size. Yes, sir. Oh, they cannot see it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Of course not, because... Uh, because I um, killed the view, so I need to use... <clears throat> No, 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 not this, this. <clears throat> so thank you very much. So, uh, <clears throat> audio is clear, but uh, picture was missing. Okay, so we're going back to this experiment here. And in this experiment, I have a container unit in L size, all right? And it's assumed to be rigid. <clears throat> now, what I will do then, another combo... Where that disappeared then? Okay, just a second. Oh, yeah, yeah, extend. You see it now. We all good. No. no, we were all good. Oh, we all good. What? Why is this? Hmm. I don't get it. Like why this is plinking. So let me just check that this is okay for one. Like yeah, I think I think it is okay. <clears throat> You know, I'm a, I'm a YouTube advocate. I really, uh, you know, YouTube is my big time favorite. But sometimes in these lecture rooms is not so convenient, particularly when I'm doing two things simultaneously. So I don't have a big, you know, my brains are not big enough to do this, this lecturing and streaming simultaneously. Of course, there are guys like Mustaba and Zuras that are helping, but still is a borderline case to me. I'm sorry about that. Okay, back to this experiment. So we have unit size container, and then I have here a lid that can go up and down. Okay, then I'm going to take a, quite a bit of force, and I'm pressing the lid downwards. What will happen as a consequence of this force is that the lid will move downwards, not necessarily much, but a little bit. Uh, because it moves downwards, the volume of the container will dis dis um, decrease. Not necessary much, but it will decrease a little bit. And another consequence is the fact that if you measure the pressure inside of the container, pressure will increase. It will increase. Okay, so the bulk modulus is all about this relation how much pressure will increase versus the change of the volume. That's what the bulk modulus is about. 
And now you may think that, okay, if there's going to be a container completely filled by air, you press the lid a little bit downwards, the volume will dis dis uh, decrease, but the pressure will not change much. That would mean that the bulk modulus of air will be low, whereas in a fluid, the pressure will rapidly increase, even though that the volume itself is not changing so much. Makes sense. Makes sense. So it's all about this relation between the change of the pressure divided by change of the volume. Minus, because volume is getting smaller. Makes sense. Okay, so what we're going to do then is that we're going to extend this to be any size of the volume. So instead of using unit size of the volume, we take the volume size into account. And when we do that, so we divide it by this uh, change of the volume by volume size. And when we do the math, this is the definition of bulk modulus. So it's minus volume size, original size, multiplied by pressure change divided by volume change. And this is it. This is it. Now, in real life, bulk modulus depends on a number of issues, number of items, including temperature, including the pressure. These are the stuff that are hard to take into account when modeling the hydraulics. And this is something that uh, is a first kind of like a highlight about modeling of hydraulics because it comes with a lot of uncertainties. It comes with a, some number of parameters that are difficult to define. It started here because already bulk modulus, we need to make an assumption that the bulk modulus or the typical assumption made is such that the bulk modulus is constant. It's not affected by pressure. It's not affected by temperature. It could, but it will complicate the simulation significantly. And even though that we're gonna select the value that is this one here, 1,500 megapascal, which is roughly when you look at this picture here, uh, it's here. And it's not necessarily de uh, describing the cases where the pressure is extremely high. Well, this by the way is unrealistically high. It's still gonna be okay. And it's still capable to produce acceptable results when we're simulating the hydraulics. Any doubts? Any concerns? It's still okay. Okay? All right. Now, <clears throat> like I say, it's practically impossible to take a container that is rigid. The container will deform, and particularly when we're using a high force, is like in a mobile machinery or hydraulics in a mobile machinery, it's there's a little bit of mechanical deformation each of the components in hydraulics. Some of them have more than others, but they will all deform. And they deformation will all affect the flexibility of fluid. How much? This is something that can be taken into account by using something that is called effective bulk modulus. Effective bulk modulus collects components that affect the flexibility. Those are air, dissolved air components like hoses. Hoses, even though that they have the steel net, they are made out of rubber material. Rubber is very, fairly flexible and they will lower the bulk modulus. And then uh, what else? Cylinders itself, they can affect as well. Pipelines, a little bit, not much, but they all will affect such the way that the effective bulk modulus will go lower. And if lower it is, more flexible is a hydraulics. All right, so uh, how you can take that into account then? Well, we're gonna redo this experiment in a way that we're gonna take a look at the system that consists of two containers that are connected together in a way that the flow can travel freely from here to here. Let's say that the pressure from this corner is same than here. So there's no throttles here that limits the most possibilities of fluid particles. Okay. 
And now when I'm going to compute the size of the volume, it's going to be this volume plus this volume. V1 plus V2. That's what it's going to be. Fluid inside of these volumes will be the ones that are this one and this one. This is how much they have oil in the containers or these containers. And now if I'm going to introduce the volume change, you know, what's going to happen is that the volumes, I mean, the, the, the fluid inside of the volumes get smaller, but the containers get bigger. I think that was in clear, unclear in the beginning. So this VCV, this one here, is the volumes of containers. So the container is getting bigger. They will expand, whereas the fluid will get smaller. Okay. All right. So this is what happens. So this is a consequence of two things deformation of uh, containers and compressibility of fluid itself. Okay, so then we're going to use this definition of bulk models, the one that is in this upper right corner of the slide, and we're going to substitute that information to back to this equation. And actually we're going to do it in a way that it is shown here, so these are the substitutions we will do. And once you do that, it reads like this. And eventually, this is how the effective bulk modulus look like. And that combines all the flexible elements, hoses, or well, fluid, I mean, dissolved air, containers, so on and so forth. If we started to 1,500 megapascal, effective bulk modulus heavily depends on your application. But if you have long hose lines, a little bit dissolved air, you can go down as much as, let's say, 300 megapascal. Maybe that's a little bit extreme case, but pretty significantly. So it's going to be more flexible than without these other elements. Okay, so this is how you can get into, how, how you, okay, sorry about that. So uh, these are the notations that I'm using here to simplify my equation. So this is my bulk modulus here. And... That's how it finally reads, and if I want to take an uh, effect of dissolved air into account, I'm just adding one more component to my original equation, and that's how it's going to be. Pretty simple. Okay, so you're happy. All right. Now, bulk modulus is dependent on pressure. This is an experiment that I found not long ago, and uh, you see that... Uh, Bulk models of air is, is highly dependent on the pressure. You see that these are the different scenarios. So this is a 16% uh, or this is 15%, I think. 10% of this salt air. And you see how they behave. Effect of uh, this salt air getting smaller when the pressure increases. But in a smaller pressures, it lowers the flexibility quite significantly. And uh, how are the metallic components or Metallic components, I think that's an incorrect statement. It should be steel containers. How those can be accounted is the symbol formulation you learn from the strength of structures. All right, so the, what I have here is a T, which is the thickness of the container. D is a diameter, and E is the elastic models. One more thing before the in-class quiz. You know, this is experiment where the effect of hoses are in included. And look at the vol values again. You know, if we started from 1,500 megapascal, it's going to be somewhere up here. Well, I'm not even put it, able to put it in a screen. And if there are hoses, you know, you can go down as low as, uh, what is this? This is a uh, 320 megapascal. So ho long hose lines will reduce the flexibility pretty significantly. Okay, with that, first in class quiz. Ah, okay. Another change this presentation. Just a second. This one. Okay, my first question is this. 
Oh, you don't see it yet. Uh, not this. Hmm. Okay, and here. You see? You don't. Okay, bulk modulus in hydraulics describes. Four is produced by a cylinder. Flexibility, compressibility of hydraulics. Oil amount in, in the circuit, so that's a hydraulic circuit. Number of components in hydraulic circuit. So which one is out of the um, four options is correct? And the game is on, and the first questions are um, 89. Uh, what you guys are saying, what, what is your guess about the success rate today? Or are you just guys are too tired to play with me? So you know what? 92. So where is 100% then? Never. 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 No. Okay, I guess that you're right because only participants too are not voting. Uh, none of them are voting 100%. Yeah, the one is saying that it should be 100. Yeah, it should. That's always the case. It's always should, but it never is. Okay, and then uh, you need some time or should we take a look at the results right away? Right away, okay, so that sounds good. Can you still see this if I... Uh... No, it always disappears when I do that. Um... Okay, is this now visible to you? No, how come it's not visible yet? Yeah, it, it's coming. Okay, I got uh, 65 answers. Should there be more? How many? We have uh, 40, 30 participants um, in a class. 41 online, so I guess that that's uh, pretty much it. And now when there is a ultra low latency, I think it only participants hear me almost real time. So in five, four, three, two, one. Somebody's saying what is a correct answer? Somebody please vote soon incorrectly. Oh my God. What? Oh my God. I, no, no, no. It, there's, okay, so we are experiencing technical difficulties today. So uh, how come? There have been so many cases much more easier than what we discussed today. Never ever correctly. Okay, so uh, here's my promise then. Okay, so uh, yeah, I know that you guys are expecting dance, but can I have an excuse? Because uh, still there's a uh, COVID that makes me feel tired. I will do it next week. Next week, I, I will do it next week, okay? That's a promise. And I will uh, do that uh, for online participants too. So uh, I don't believe this. What is wrong with you people? I don't know. Can, can I take a picture of this? Can I send this to rector to say, hey, look at me. Okay, so that's going to be extra point for each of you. Hopefully Mustafa can somehow take care of it. Weird. Really weird. Okay, so... 
Okay, so good news. Some pretty seriously good news. Okay, another thing that uh, another feature or another properties of fluid that I'm about to shortly. No, this is not willing to do it to me. That I will shortly explain. Is this viscosity? I'm not going to be brief because I'm a little bit in a hurry. I want to go to this lump fluid theory. No. Not showing. Okay, here it comes. Okay. Plinking like no limit. All right, so uh, viscosity. Now, to understand the viscosity, we need to make another experiment again. In this experiment, we're going to take a plate and we're going to move this plate in the top of the uh, fluid film. And when we're going to do that, there is going to be particles that will attach, I mean, fluid particles to be more specific, that will attach to this plate. So this here is a plate. And I'm moving the plate to right side direction by using a force because I need to use a force. <clears throat> and I'm going to do that by using a velocity V here. <clears throat> and <clears throat> the height of uh, fluid film is going to be divided by, it's going to be defined by Y coordinate here. So Y is telling me how much fluid I have here. I need certain amount of force because the particles will behave in a way that the particles next to the plate will have the same velocity than a plate, all right? Whereas the particle next to the crown, so this is standing still, this is not moving anywhere, their velocity is zero, and the rest of the particles have the velocity profile roughly linearly distributed, roughly. And because they're linearly distributed, they will have a shear force between the particles. They don't have the same velocity, but different velocities, and that means that there is a shear. Because of the shear, force that I need here is non-zero. That's going to be my definition of viscosity. Okay. But what is that I need here? So I want to use, uh, you know, the, the force that I needed to move the plate can be expressed by when I know the cross I mean, area laying towards the fluid. And uh, once I know something which is called absolute viscosity, absolute viscosity, and then the velocity and the thickness of the heat of the fluid film. So those are the information I need. When I'm using the definition of shear force, which is force divided by corresponding cross-section area, this equation here can be simplified as this. Every fluid we use in hydraulics behaves roughly according to this equation. This uh, equation is called Newton's law, and uh, and pretty much every fluids that are following this this equation are called Newtonian's fluid. And that's pretty much the case every single one we are looking in this course. So this is this one here is something we're interested in, but the way that is expressed. It's not going to be very practical for us. So I'm going to make a minor adjustment to my equation. I'm going to use something that is called kinematic viscosity. And that's something that you can see in real life. That's you can get by dividing the kinematic viscosity by density. And when you do so, then uh, that's going to be your definition of viscosity. Now, the kinematic viscosity is a heavily function of temperature, like you can see in this picture here. So this is a V here, the same as kinematic viscosity, and this is expressed even in logarithmic scale, so heavily dependent on velocity. And those ones that are doing rally cars, racing motorcycles and such, you know that you need to warm up your engine first before you go fast. And that's simply because the viscosity is so heavily dependent on temperature. You need to make sure that your engine is in the right temperature before you want it to load it heavily. Okay, so that, again, something we don't need so much because 
it only affects in a laminar flow. In engines, you can see this laminar flow quite frequently, but in the mobile machinery, not so much. Okay. Right, here comes the main body of today's lecture. This is what I'm going to explain to you, and then I'm going to stop. So no flow, flow types today, but uh, land fluid theory. What is the deal with the land fluid theory? This is where I would like you to follow me carefully. All right, land fluid theory is like a foundation of the computation. And what we're going to do here is that uh, we're going to divide our hydraulic circuit in the volumes where we assume to be pressure to be equally distributed. You know, there could be, you know, dimensions that are pretty high, pretty large, but we can still make an assumption that in this particular volume, the pressure is equally distributed. Okay, when pressure is not equally distributed. Well, when, for your example, when you have a pipeline like this, and then you have a total middle of the pipeline. You cannot make an assumption that the pressure here is same than pressure here, because this throttle here will introduce some motion limitation to flow particles. And because of that, the flow will not travel without any limitation through this throttle. And that's why the pressure P1 and pressure P2 will not be equal to each other. Every single component you have in your hydraulic circuit can be seen as a throttle, something that limits the flow possibilities of your fluid. And they will introduce the pressure differences in your system. Now, I can compute my pressure here by using the differential equation that I'm about to introduce to you and here as well. No difficulties whatsoever. But I cannot make an assumption that this one here, P2, is equal to P1. That's not going to happen. Okay, so when this is uh, valid, is valid, pretty much all the cases. The only exception is that waves, pressure waves, within the volumes are not accounted because we are assuming the pressure to be equally distributed. And when there's a pressure waves, that's not the case. That's not the case. Okay, and in mobile machinery, it's mentioned here that the pipelines are relatively short and the work cycles are relatively slow. So the pressure waves, generally speaking, are not so significant. Okay, now what's going to happen then? So we first kind of discretize our hydraulic circuit within the volume where we are assuming pressure to be equally distributed. Once that is done, then we're going to form differential equations describing each of the volumes. So it's going to be first order differential equations. So it's not going to be as complicated, nowhere near as complicated than in the case of multibody system dynamics. So it's way more simple, but it's still a differential equation that tells how is a pressure as a function of time. And when we're solving that, we can get the pressure. Similar kind of concept like you know, in uh, multi-body system dynamics, we started here from acceleration. We went to velocity, and velocity, we went to position. Here, we're going to get started from P dot, and we're going to go to P. And once we know the P pressure in different locations of hydraulic circuit, finally, we can compute how much force is produced by each one of the components. Well. Basically, we have a two different kind of actuators. We have cylinders and a motors. Cylinder, if we know the pressure and corresponding cross-section area, that's your force. That's all you need to know. But the pressure plays a very important role. Okay. Okay, so pretty much what I just say, the different volumes are separated by throttles, which uh, through which... Uh, Flow can, fluid can flow. That's pretty much the case. We're going to take a look at the examples momentarily. So that sheds a light to this concept. Every single component are considered as a throttle, not more than a throttle. That's the concept behind. Okay, here's a damper. Now, how many volumes, or how many differential equations are needed to describe this damper? 
No, no, that's the first question. So can we make an assumption that the pressure, let's say, this corner is same than lower corner here? In all cases, you cannot. Because it may be the case that, you know, this is, uh, the cylinder is attached to the frame and I'm moving this piston seriously back and forth. So if I press this piston downwards, what will happen is that the pressure here started to increase. So pressure one goes up, whereas the pressure here, pressure two goes down. I would say that this needs to be like this. Like this. Now the drilling that you see here, try to equalize the pressure difference. But if it is made, like usually is the case in dampers, it's not able to do it in the same second. If there will be no flow, no flow limitations, it will happen in a second. But here is not the case, because it takes a while, you know, the pressure increases here, goes up, pressure goes down here, and because of the pressure difference, the flow started to flow this direction try to equalize the pressure difference. So that's how it goes. But if I will give a, a random moment of time, then I cannot say that the pressure here in this corner is same that the pressure in this corner. They are not just the same. That's why I need to divide, or let's say discretize my damper to do different volumes, each of which will be modeled by using differential equations. Okay, here is my volume one, which describes part above the piston. So everything above the piston is described by using this volume, where I'm computing the pressure, bulk modulus, and volume size. I will do the same for the volume below the piston, this one here. And again, I have my same quantities, pressure, elastic, uh, effective bulk modulus, and the volume size. And the flow rate travels this through these throttles, try to equalize the pressure difference. That's what it is. Only missing component here is that how is that we can create this differential equation that describes the pressure as a function of time. That's pretty much it. Any comments? Any questions? No comments, no questions. Okay, here comes a, okay, I need to sit down to see this better. Okay, here is a hydraulic system where there is a, there is assumed to be constant pressure source. That is then connected to direction valve. Direction valve will introduce the pressure difference. So I cannot assume the pressure here, let's say if this is a source pressure, the pressure which is this one here, A1, to be same than this one, because they are not. And that's simply because the differential, this uh, direction valve will introduce the pressure losses. Because the flow cannot travel completely without any limitation through this direction valve. Okay, so I need to compute the pressure in this, this location. Here, this uh, component is called counterbalance valve. And counterbalance valve, it's like a throttle again. So sometimes limits seriously the flow, sometimes not so much, but it can limit it seriously. So I cannot make an assumption that the pressure here, which is called PA2, is same than PA1 because of this component. So the differential equations that I needed are two equations, this one here describing this part, and this one describing this part, okay? Then, when I look at the piston rod side, piston rod side, I have just the one line that is connected to the direction valve. So I can make an assumption that the pressure right before the direction valve is same that the pressure somewhere inside of the uh, piston rod of the cylinder. You know, depending how you do these connections, but that okay assumption. There may be some throttles in a practical life, but not necessarily. So I can just use a one differential equation to do the computing. That's it. So that's the concept behind. So this is called discretization. Do you understand the concept? 
Next, we're going to take a look at how is that we can describe these as a, using using this uh, first order differential equation. Okay. Okay, this may be too difficult for you, but let me uh, let me see. In land fluid theory, hydraulic system below can be modeled as you know this is a one-way cylinder. So this cylinder can be pressurized only in uh, piston side, not in a piston rod side. Okay, so the question is, um, which one of the many opportunities is the correct way to model it? So there's a pressure source here, which is uh, the one mentioned here. And then there is a direction valve, which will introduce some pressure losses. But how many differential equations you need after that? Do you need to take this uh, other line into account, which is not the case? I said already. Okay, so another in-class quiz. And I'm worried, seriously worried. Because you guys seem to be so clever today, so it makes me very worried. Okay, let me take myself back. Ah. Uh, Okay, so uh, like, yeah, sorry that I, I mute myself. So, so uh, I said that this is um, not so simple than other in-class quiz because this is related to this discretization procedure. And that's um, a little bit complicated. So take your, take your time, communicate with your fellow student. And once you're done with that, then we will go and we will take a look at this differential equation business. And then we're, that's when we're gonna stop today, okay? Okay, would you like to take some more look about this slide or should I, can I, can I go on? Can I, going on? It's okay, so I can go. Okay. All right, so here's the, uh, the mystery about this uh, differential equation. So I'm going to divide it for you. And again, there is an experiment, kind of an experiment. And in uh, this experiment that I'm looking at the moment, I have a control volume here. And in my control volume, I have mass flow that is getting in, a mass flow that you can describe by density multiplied by flow rate. Density of the material that is getting in multiplied by flow rate. And then the mass flow that is living out from the control volume is gonna be the same quantity, but those ones that are leaving Okay, material of the flow in this control volume is a density multiplied by flow inside of this control volume. This is pretty much the, all the components that I need. Then I'm simply going to use a definition of mass and some differential equation, and that's going to be your first order differential equation that tells how is a description of pressure. Okay, definition of mass. That's the first thing. We all know that the mass is equal than the density multiplied by volume size. Correct. So in this experiment we're looking at, the only way that the mass inside of this control volume can change is that there is a difference between incoming and outgoing mass flow. If they are same, mass within this control volume will be same. No difference. But if there's more material coming in than leaving out, mass started to increase another way around. Make sense? Okay, so now 
the difference of the mass is difference between incoming and outgoing mass flow. That's what it is. So now I can substitute this information here. And my equation reads like this. So it's a time differentiation of uh, density multiplied by volume minus mass flow in, mass flow out. And this is the equation that I use here. All right, so then I do this mathematical operation. So I'm going to use this differential operation. So I'm going to have a um, density depends on dependence on the on the, the time and the volume size, and then the change of the volume multiplied by density. That's what it is. So this is what I use is a basic math. Makes sense. And then again the flow rate in, flow rate out. And uh, when I continue to manipulate my equations, I can express this equation in a way that I assuming that material density all the time is changed. I mean, it's constant. It's not change, changing depending if it is coming in or living out, or even if it is within this control volume. When I do this assumption, I can express my differential equation as it is shown here. I'm getting close, very close. Only problem is that I have here density. I don't like density. I would like to have a pressure instead of density. So I need to find this relation between the density and the volume change. And this is a relation that comes directly from the math. So this is a, so this is a chain rule of differentiations. It comes from this uh, dV rho is equal to minus d rho v. This equation it came from. And when I use this together with the definition of bulk modulus, I can use and I can build this relation. So it's dp and I mean d rho dp that I'm relating here. And once I use this re this uh, definition, this is how my original equation uh, reads. I'm going kind of fast, but that's okay because what matters end of the day is that what I have in my equation, nothing else. How I derive it less important. Makes sense. Okay. So then the final thing is that I will take everything except this one here, which is a P dot to left hand side of the equation, excuse me, right hand side of the equation. And this is how my differential equation look like. Now what I have here is a P dot pressure as a change of the time, as a function of time is equal than effective bulk modulus. So flexibility is accounted. My volume size my flow rate in, my flow rate out. Sometimes there are components like hydraulic cylinder where the size of the volume itself is changing. That is accounted by using this last component of the equation. And this is it. Now I can create the equation. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I wanted to say equation of motion for every single part of the hydraulic circuit. This is not the equation of motion, but equation that describes pressures. And I can solve them any given time because I know my flow rate in, I know my flow rate out. That's everything that I need. And then I can compute how much force is produced by a single component. All right, so there's another question, but now let me go, one fluid theory ignores something. And is it pressure waves within the hydraulic volumes? Same change of the size of the hydraulic volume, and you need to take a look at what are these different components. This is taking the change of the volume into account. Physical size of the hydraulic volume, I, you can take a look at this equation and think if it is there. Compressibility, effective bulk modulus of hydraulic volume. Take a look. All right, so then back to this. Uh, uh, you know, see it again. Okay, let me see how can I make this visible for you. Duplicate. No. Yeah, there it is. What's going to be a success rate this time? 
So let me, all the participants are not making any guesses about that. They got scared about the great success we got. Okay, now they are coming. Now they are coming. But kind of low, so it's 80, 88, uh, 83, 74, 88, 82. Okay, what are you guys are saying? 100%. 80, 85. Last time I think we got uh, 65 students, so now it's 60, okay, 61. So momentarily we're gonna close this. And uh, then I'm gonna take this uh, final in-class quiz and then we call for a day. Okay, that's the plan. Okay, so we got uh, one more, oh no, three more students. So in five, four, three, okay, I'm going to close it. Ah, 75. And this was a difficult case. I need to get back to this next week to explain a little bit about what is the deal with this. Final question, final in-class quiz of the day is in land fluid theory. What is that is ignored? Is it the pressure waves within the hydraulic volume? Change of the size of the hydraulic volume? Physical size of the hydraulic volume? Compressibility of hydraulic volume? One only is correct. But which one is correct? And the game is on. Now, the, I don't know if it is uh, this game or a previous game, but uh, somebody is guessing 100%. No, 110%. I, I read it incorrectly. 110%. That's, uh, that sounds like pretty, pretty good to me. And after this, we're going to close. So it's going to be, uh, the lecture was an hour and a 15 minutes. So sorry that it... It was an hour and a half, but an uh, hour and a 15. And, but next week, if I... Um, if I'm back myself, then uh, of course we're gonna we're gonna go back to the user rhythm. Next week there's gonna be this dancing event as well. Still gonna keep my shirt on. Is what? What? You mean here? I don't know. I have no idea. I was so uh, I was so surprised that I wasn't prepared to this at all. I have no idea. I think it's some kind of gangster rap because that's uh, what I uh, like. Because of all these uh, respect stuff. <laughs> but I have no idea. What what could be a good music? Some kind of '90s hits, I think. We, I don't know. So yeah, I, I need to figure that out. This let's get the move it, move it. Would that be okay? Because it's like kind of a little bit like a multi-body. Oh my God! I don't know why is uh you know this is a this was a big surprise. This never happened to me before. Now you make it to me. Okay, but now back to this one here. Uh. Okay, so there's uh, some good ideas about uh, Wu-Tang Clan. Okay, what is the sax? Okay, we've got uh, 52 answers. So can you guys focus on this and uh, place your uh, answer to the system and then we're good to go. Or, okay, can, is there a room for negotiation? Is there a room for flexibility from your end? Would it be possible to dance in the last lecture or you guys insist that it's going to be next week? Last, oh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. <laughs> is what? Really? Because I was thinking five seconds. 
Okay, all right. So I'm uh, I'm in a big trouble. I'm in a big trouble, but big surprise. Last lecture. Okay, the others are voting the the last lecture. Okay, so that gives me a little bit of time to to take myself to dancing classes. I couldn't believe that that's going to happen. Okay, so but uh, here, so results. So we got 62 uh, answers. So I think that's pretty much it. So the correct one is uh, press of waves. High, but not 100%. I don't know what's going to happen if we're going to score 100% again. Yeah, two dances would be a solution for that. Okay. All right, so we're going to call for the day. So we're closing 10 minutes earlier than usually. Thank you very much, guys. It was a lot of fun, like always. See you guys around and take it easy.